something a little bit different today. Um, I want to walk through an illustration uh, with some, a little bit of data um, to extend our conversation from last week. Last week, we talked a lot about um, market segments, segmentation, and that process of dividing up a, a market. So let's just talk about that a little bit more. Um, go through an illustration if we can. Sound good? Everybody on board? Everybody doing well? Excellent. All right. So, um, first of all, when we do um, segmenting, the reason why we're doing this is to identify groups of consumers um, that we can target, that we can try to make a conscientious effort to reach with um, the, the scarce resources we have. So, we want to advertise, we want to bring the product and channels to, to this market. Um, we want to cater our, our, our messaging to this group of individuals, and so on. So the idea is, instead of trying to reach everybody, let's try to identify customers who are going to be profitable, identify customers who are going to most likely be motivated to buy our product, and let's focus and channel our resources to them so that we can have a relationship with them, right? So this idea of market segmentation is critically important, and, and it really kind of takes us that one step further after the markets. Now the question is, well, what is the market, and what are those markets made of, and who, who make up the markets? So if you'll remember from last week, we had this idea of segmentation, where we're going to take segmentation... segmentation criteria and we're going to use different criteria to identify individuals, regroup individuals and so on and so forth. And so we have to choose what those criteria are. We said there's lots and lots of different criteria we can use. We're generally found in four different broad areas. Uh, demographic Right? Um, geographic, behavioral, um, and psycho, either psychographic or psychometric, just depending on, you'll see it's spelled two different ways or done two different ways, okay? So, um, and we can have lots and lots of different criteria here that we could characterize individuals, consumers by, and then use those criteria to regroup them. And again, the idea is we have lots of consumers out there who have all these traits. What we want to do is group consumers that have similarities among them. And very importantly, after we're done with this, the segment that we choose would be individuals or consumers who react similarly to our marketing efforts. Right? And that's kind of where the rubber meets the road and we, we end up. But segmentation criteria. So we can collect all this data and, and basically what we're going to end up with is we've got this, this population, this ma the, 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 the mass population that's out there. And we'll ultimately you know, choose these criteria among all these people and we're going to basically group together people who share a similar, a similar trait. So I'll just use some different kind of ways to, to symbolize you know, what these people might be. And this might be segment number one, this might be segment number two, this might be segment number three. Maybe we use the criteria of income. This is just one of thousands. Let's say income, we had lower income, middle income, higher income three different sort of groups and one of these market segments represents each of those three groups using the criteria income. Maybe we use age. We use young, middle, old and we have that as a differentiator that separates these groups. That's the criteria that we used. Um, maybe we have people who walk into the restaurant, people who call ahead and order, 
Bloomberg and then people who use DoorDash. Three different ways customers interact with us. We use that as a differentiator, as that criteria that would be behavioral, right? That would be, that would be a behavior. Oh, you can't be serious. Did I just do that? Can I get back? Oh, I don't want to discard anything, but I do want to go back. Okay. Is that All right. All right. So that's, that's the point. Okay. Now, uh, we mentioned this idea that choosing, thank you, Jess, for your name. We said this idea that choosing criteria is a difficult challenge. We want to use criteria, I, th I think. And I think it's, it, it's, it's well supported that you want to use criteria that um, helps form behavior, criteria that explains behavior or motivation to buy. Um, a lot of times demographic data doesn't do a particularly good job at that, but be that as it may, this is kind of what I want to talk about, show you an illustration of here. So the way we do this is we'll go out and we'll do research and we'll collect data on consumers. And um, what we want to do is use some analysis to regroup consumers so that they go together. And so get another get another page here. So um, so what we'll do is you'll do the exact same type of thing and what we'll have is a population See if I can do this, thinking through this the best way. And we want to do like we just did and organize them together. So um, depending on where they are in here, the data will, you put the data in the database, we'll run some analysis. The analysis will separate respondents into groups. So here's the thing though, what if we have two or three or four or a hundred different criteria. It's really hard to just kind of muscle through and do mechanically by yourself. You would never do that, right? You know, if you had two or three, great, no problem. We could regroup two or three criteria, you know, our, 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 our consumers. But what if you had hundreds, right? You'd want some type of statistical method to be able to do that uh, because there's a lot going on. So what we do in market research is something called cluster analysis. Um, and um, you could do it in SAS or R. You can do it in all kinds of different languages or in software packages. Um, here, at, here at Coastal, um, if you're going to do this, you probably, if you're in marketing, you do it in SPSS. I don't know, is anybody familiar with SPSS? Anybody? Yeah, you have access to it as a student if you would like it. Um, but cluster analysis is going to do this, where it's going to take all of these criteria, and what it'll do is it'll create basically um, like an algorithm. For every single respondent. And respondents whose algorithms are similar to each other, they'll group them together. For, for, for respondents whose algorithms are very different from each other, they'll separate them apart. So what happens is in this big circle, depending on that algorithm created in cluster analysis, you'll have individuals, each other, as they are kind of similar to each other, right? So you'll have these groupings that happen where regardless of where they are, and, and everybody will be sort of placed in proximity to others who are similar to them, again, based on the criteria that we have. And so you'll have sort of a center point, and you'll have this subsequent sort of cluster of customers, just like we just looked at, that'll, that'll look kind of like that. 
and they'll be placed in the cluster as a function of their distance they are from, we call the centroid center, the center of their cluster. Okay, so this is a statistical process that happens, um, and this is how we do it in market. This is how we identify clusters. So, any questions so far? We good so far? I know this is just kind of random, right? But this is how we do. This is how we do segmenting. How we form segments um, using data. So, so I want to keep this, but I do want to get out of this temporarily. I'm going to go out here. Um, I'm going to give, share with you some some um, some data. So this is this is from uh, a a research data from a research class that that I've run many 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 times before. We've got basically. Let me give you the lay, layout. We've got two different restaurants. We have Jose's and we have Charlie's. Okay, these are Tex-Mex restaurants, and they 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 want to know kind of about their customers. They want to know like how well they're performing, stuff like that. Okay, and so this survey data um, has a survey, and basically you want to look at the first few uh, first eleven or so items. So this is a survey that goes out. But if we look at these first few items, this. <coughs> This, this one through 11. I don't know if you can read those or not, uh, but this is like somebody answers on a survey. I think the scale might be one to seven, like one being not at all, seven being very, very, you know, this is me or whatever, this is, this is who I am. Um, so one to seven scale, um, and, and with these questions, like I try new and different things. Yes or no, or just very little or very high. I'm a party person. People come to me. I avoid fried foods. I like to go out socially. Friends come to me. I'm self-confident. I eat balanced, nutritious meals. I like to buy new products. I'm careful about what I eat, and I try new brands. Now, these are all psychometric-type properties. These are all personality things, right? Right Now, and you'll notice that some of these questions kind of go together. Two or three ones that relate to eating healthy. So they kind of go together. Right? So when we do research, uh, we often will create what we call um, scales that go together. And then what we'll do is take the average of those items and treat the, that as a, as a composite score. So try new things. Um, uh, I buy new products, I try new brands. Those three items measure innovation. How innovative a person is would be measured by those three items. Whatever you score on those three items, we'll average them together, and your composite score for innovation will be the mean or the average of those three things. I'm a party person. Okay, I like to go out socially. Those actually are two separate, two, two things that kind of are your kind of outgoing personality. We also have one that's very close. It'd be called market mavenism, which is measured by uh, people come to me, my friends come to me, and I'm self-confident. Those, those statistically, when you measure those, all go, those three questions go together. So those, those go together. And then, um, I think, was there one more? The party person, the social one. I don't know, there's, there's three or four sort of ideas here, right, that, that kind of go together. And so in the data, we'll pull up the data here. So you see the survey, you see kind of the questions here. We'll pull up some, some data here, and we'll take a look at, look at this. The, these first two columns are these ones where, you know, I, the, the person's a party person, and they, they go out. So these two questions measure... And I call and I'm calling this social average. Okay, so how social is a person? And this is kind of so you like to party, you like, like to go out a lot, you're gonna score high on this close to seven. If you don't, you don't. This is a personality trait. Right? So this is one of these characteristics we might use to segment a market by. Okay, here's here's another another set of questions. These three people come to me, my friends come to me for advice, I'm self-confident. I don't know if you've heard of the term market maven. A market maven is somebody who knows a lot about a product category, who has a lot of advice about a product category. 
Now, I use my brother-in-law as an example when I talk about market mavens. He knows all kinds of things about digital products. So, like, if I were to go buy a new laptop, or if I was going to buy anything tech-related, I would call him up, and I'd just ask him, hey, what would you buy? And he'll rattle off for, like, an hour all of this, like, stuff I could buy. I'm like, okay, just get to the point. What should I buy? And Because he's a market, because he knows that product category so much better than I do. Um, that's, that's what the, these questions measure, market mavenism. Do people come to you for advice? Are you knowledgeable in a product category? You know, and that that's, so that's kind of, that's what this measures. This is a personality trait, right? Okay, we've got another one. We've got the, the healthy eating questions. So we've got those, people answer. And again, for each of these, I've got an average, right? So we have an average score for each of these. Okay, and then finally, we have the innovation one. The innovation questions. So I try new new brands. I buy new new products. I try new things. Innovation. Right? Okay. So we've got these questions. We have four personality traits. We're going to use these four personality traits and think about clustering. Now I am not going to show this or provide an example today in SPSS. However, if you're at all interested, let me know. I have, I used to teach this in SPSS all the time, so let me know if you're interested, but a little bit beyond kind of the scope of what we do. Um, so I'm just going to keep this in Excel. This is available for you in Moodle. <laughs> do this. But but this is the data, so this is kind of what the data looks like. I'm going to shift over, open up one more file for you. This is going to be our cluster analysis file here. Uh, it's, it's just a template. Um, and we're going to have, you could read this if you want. But here's what, here's, here's what we do. In tab number one, input the data, okay? Um, I've, I've, I've already put in the data. Um, I've just cut it and pasted it from one Excel file that you just saw to this one. And what we need to do here is we just need to put in these averages for each respondent. So I have each respondent, one. This, this file here will allow you to do up to 100 respondents. So, so the, the, the original data file has 405. Let's take the first hundred. It's probably it's not very random, but it's fine for this example today. We have a lot of people, a lot of innovators are sixes and sevens. So that's I may want to relook at that. That's not great. But anyways, so so the instructions are you input the data, health, social, maven, and what it's gonna do is it's going to look at these respondents, and it's going to group together respondents that behave similarly to each other. All right? And again, think of centroids. Think of that bringing together idea. So we'll click here, output clusters. Okay, now what we didn't look at before, which I should probably look at here, is this idea that I drew three clusters. You as a researcher, you as a marketer, you need to look at the market and the magic number might not be three. It might be two, it might be five. You know, when you look at a market, you know, how much you want to segment, segment really translates to how like fine-tuned each of those segments are gonna be. Does that make sense? Like if I take the market, I take just two, two segments, well, those two segments, they might be different, but they're going to include a lot of stuff. If I start saying, well, no, I want four or five or six segments, that means that I'm going to have, each segment's going to have fewer people in it, but each segment will be more finely defined. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so this is one thing about research. Sometimes we have to make decisions as researchers. This is a classic example. I drew three clusters but you might only have two or might have four. 
something like that. So when we look at this spreadsheet here, and again, this is a little bit different from what we normally do. When we look at the spreadsheet, what it'll do is these first, this first solution, and there are multiple solutions, but this first solution has returned two segments based on the data that we've given, okay, the, the overall data. And if you could look here, you see this 3.43 for segment one and 5.58 for social. Those are the centers, the centroids, the center point of those clusters for those variables. Okay, does that make sense? So, so we take all these variables, well each variable has a cluster center, and basically the way you look at this is you say, okay, we have segment number one. Segment number one compared to segment number two, well, on the health dimension, they score pretty similar to each other. But on the social dimension, segment number one is clearly much more social than segment number two. And this is how they differentiate from each other. This is how you would say segment one is different from segment two. On the dimension of health, they're clearly different, right? Or on social, they're clearly different. On health, they're mostly the same. The maven dimension, they're mostly the same too. The innovation dimension suggests that, again, so segment one is higher or more innovative than segment two. So we have two different market segments in this first solution. They're mainly differentiated by their level of social socialness and their level of innovation. Okay. Oh, I didn't crunch a hundred respondents across these four metrics, four measures. I let the data do it in a process called cluster analysis. Now there are lots of different ways to do cluster analysis. This is just one example using Excel. Okay, so, so it has its limits, but it's a good illustration of how we would do this in real life. This is how it's done in real life. We collect data, and then we run cluster analysis, and we form segments. Okay, now a couple other things you're going to notice just in this first solution area, this, this, this solution here for two clusters. We have two clusters. We would like to name them at some point, give them a name like a profile name. We would do that. Um, we would also want to notice that the the number out of the out of the people there, or out of how many that are that are that are there, fifty six of our hundred fell into segment one. Thirty two of the hundred fell into segment two. Now that doesn't add up to a hundred. I get that. Some people didn't fit in either, and they are they're like outliers. They, they don't fit in either group well enough um, to, to, to be in there. And I say, well, why don't they fill it, fit in there well enough? It's a great question. Um, to get into the nitty gritty, I drew a little sort of a circle. I, 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 did, I, I did kind of a circle around there. We actually define that distance. So if there's that centroid, and a distance from the centroid to the edge, we'll define that. And if nobody fits into one of these categories, well, then they're not in, then they're not in the solution. They're not categorized. Okay, so, so that's why, again, you kind of look at this as a head scratcher. Why, does, why doesn't this add up to, to 100? Well, well, that's why. But also note that 63% of our respondents are in segment one. 36% are in segment two. So it's like, okay, if I had to choose segment one or segment two, segment one's larger. If I chose to choose, if I chose, do I have a better opportunity for more market share? I'd have a better opportunity for more sales because there's more people in that segment. But my marketing mix and kind of what I do and my message and who I would be would need to cater to the social innovator. Somebody who likes to, I'd have to have new things on the menu. I'd have to have like new things that they could experience and that they would like and that they would appreciate. I have to foster an exciting, fun atmosphere. 
These are social people. I need to have dinner clubs. I need to do things that would you know, cater to that personality. Does that make sense? But now it's a choice, though. You, you don't have to choose that market segment. You can choose the other market segment if you wanted to. That would be fine as well. Right? All right, so another, so, so you know, kind of another, another segment, or actually I'll tell you what we'll do, with segmentation maps. So just kind of looking here now. Um, now, again, this is an Excel template, so it's a little limited. This is just a two by two map that shows the relationship between segment one and segment two. This template only shows the first two columns. It doesn't show the rest of the data all together. Again, you know, you, there's plenty of other software that will do it. But, but, but the illustration, I think, serves where you have segment one, segment two. You have a couple different dimensions here. And again, the reason why health is there is because it's one of those first two categories. And it sort of, sort of shows the relational space that these, these folks where these folks are. Okay. Third, third illustration of this group would include, would include a mapping of the centroids. I use that term several times because it's an important term. Um, and so this map here kind of shows you in a picture where those respondents are relative to each other and relative to their centroids. It also shows how close the centroids are to each other, kind of in a picture. Right, so you'll see a little overlap. You'll see you'll see some cases where we have some red in around that blue, and maybe it's because red's not real. So red is. See what red is? It's red. Red is the red is the second, the second segment. Blue diamonds are this the first segment. Could be that second segment's not quite as well defined, uh, but there's got to be some overlap there. So imagine, so remember, like you have market segments, they can overlap. They don't have to be, we want them to be mutually exclusive, but they aren't always mutually exclusive. Sometimes they overlap a little bit, right? Um, and so, so that's something to kind of just remember in the back of your mind that we have some overlapping going on. Okay, so, so we imported the data once again. So that another solution, though, might be a three-cluster solution. And as you were, if you were to scroll down here, you'll go up to five cluster solutions, and we have cluster membership down below for each each respondent. Okay, so so we have so we have a three cluster solution here, and again we can go back through interpretation. Um, it, it looks like segment three is particularly low on innovation, uh, while the other two are high. That's okay. So that can add to our sort of description of them. It seems like they're all fairly low or middling on health, except for three. Three might be a healthier like segment, but less innovative than the others. Um, clearly, segment one is still still popping on the, the social scale. Segment three is low on so segment three is not very social, not very innovative, but healthy. It seems relative to everybody else that's that that's there. Okay, segment two seems to be the Maven group, a group that is not only high on innovation, but also high higher on, on the Mavenism scale. Okay, now look, I'm kind of I'm kind of interpreting this. This is a little subjective. You could disagree, right? You can look at those numbers and say described differently, right? And that's okay. That's, that's the, so this is actually a method of exploratory research. It's, it's a trial and error type of process very often, very often. It's not like it's not like hypothesis testing where you have an answer and it is either yes or it is no. Studies where you kind of have to use a little judgment and you have to kind of, kind of think about what's happening. And this guy kind of said, well, okay, maybe I want this three, three cluster solution, and I see three different market segments there. Again, if I kind of scroll down a little bit, I can see where these markets sort of relate or how they relate to each other in a, in a spatial sense. Um, 
Again, the caveat is this particular template only uses the first two dimensions or the first two columns of data, social and health. You can move them around. You can move your data around if you want different maps to look, or you want the maps to look different. Go to the, cent the, 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 the centroids, and now we have a little bit of a different thing. Now, remember, we have three clusters we're looking at, right? Not, not two anymore. We have three. We see that the, the blue and the black um, centroids, so this is a centroid, 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 you will see that those are, the blue and the black are kind of closer to each other, where the red is a little... Um, now, these little dots, the, the squares and circles, they're not like for every single respondent, you know, they're, 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 they're graphics. So, so, but you get the idea of kind of where they're related or where they kind of see each other. You also see that red still sort of overlaps a little bit. Um, so red is um, third, the, third, the healthy, uh, not less innovative, less social group. There's the black group in segment two, and then, and then segment one is again in that blue. Okay, so um, so anyways, I, I, I just want to offer this to you to kind of give you some insight in terms of how segmentation is actually done with data, um, how we would do it in practice, right? We go out and collect some data from our market, these segmentation <laughs> criteria, um, again, these happen to be psychographic in nature, um, just kind of personality traits, but we could use all different kinds of data, uh, all different kinds of measures on how we might want to describe the market segments. We would put it into um, into data set, we take that data set, we'd apply something called cluster analysis to it, um, and kind of go from there and let, let the cluster analysis help us identify viable, viable market segments. Again, kind of going back to this page, we had our three segments here. We also have the distribution of, of, of members, if you will. So only 10% make up this third group, where 46 and 43 make up groups one and two respectively. Okay. So that again tells you a little bit a little bit more. Now it might be that this healthy, less innovative, sort of less social group segment number three, it might be that they're incredibly loyal. It might be that they're incredibly um, they have a lot of profit margin. It might be they might be very, very willing to spend a lot extra for healthier food options. And so it may be in your wheelhouse to serve them, right? It's kind of you have to decide, you know, what what type of you know what type of position you want to play to be in the marketplace, and how you want to how you want to approach that. Okay, so what do you have any questions? Any thoughts? Again, if anybody is interested in. Uh, a deeper dive in cluster analysis, just let me know. I've got lots of data sets, and I, I, I do this almost not on a daily basis, but pretty often um, I use, use this, use some of these methods here. Okay, so cool, good. good. That's a fun, I like doing it. This is, I, I have to tell you, um, I do a lot of research in branding. Branding is kind of my area, one of my areas. So, so this whole topic tonight, uh, all the things that we talk about, I think are super fun topics to talk about. Uh, I don't know, yeah. Yeah, sorry, before we move on, um, can you just briefly explain what the SPSS is? It's like some sort of program that does that, or it's... Um, Absolutely, yeah. so I wonder, let me just, I, we, I don't know if we can pull it up here, I don't know if we have access. To, I don't know if this computer is being set. So I don't want to search the web. I, I just want. Okay. Uh, uh, so SPSS is a product by IBM. Um, it's a statistical software package. Um, when you open it up, it looks a lot like Excel. You have to define, 
it tends to be very user friendly. There's almost no, so, so this is a big differentiator for SPSS. There's almost no coding involved. It's not like R, it's not like Python, not like, not like SAS, where it's not even like Excel macros. It's not like you're coding anything. You don't have to code anything. So, and this is a big thing. So we don't do a lot. So like, like here at our college of business, we have an analytics minor, and we have some analytics classes and things like that where you got to learn R and you got to learn some coding. When you shift over to marketing research, we do a lot less coding work. We do a ton of analysis, and so SPSS is a very popular solution that a lot of companies will use. So again, and not to belabor the point, but all students have access, a, a, a license access to, to it. Um, you have to go through some hurdles to get it, but through ITS here on campus, you, you, can, you can definitely definitely do that. So anything that you want to do, um, any modeling, like any general linear modeling, um, Gosh, you can do all kinds of fun stuff with it. If that's your, if that's what you think is fun. <laughs> all right, very good, thank you. Any other questions? All right, okay. All right, let's talk a little bit about branding. Let's, let's see what we can think about here. All right, so, um, so like I said, we're gonna talk or topically kind of wrap around a few different things tonight, just kind of see where we go. Um, so branding, uh, it, it, it encapsulates the image and the feeling and the meaning behind a company or its products or kind of the entity of the firm. And when we step into this idea of branding, um, just know, and we'll just talk a little bit about brand identity to start with. The idea that there are many things that are in our control when we start to develop brand. What our brand is, what it should be, and so on and so forth. So, so just kind of think about like your logo, your color scheme, the font you use for your lettering, your slogan, the name of your company or the name of your brand, right? the name of your products. Um, those are all things that we have a fair amount of control over, and many times we look to adjust those and change those and adapt those, right? Um, that's pretty common to do. However, at the end of the day, we intersect with the market, with the market space, with consumers, and <laughs> consumers have to interpret what they think the brand is. In other words, brand meaning is derived from the consumer's interpretation of what they see and think and feel about you. And so the question is, what should that be? And what is that? You know, we did that, that thing earlier where we looked at Patagonia a little bit, talked about kind of the image. You have a very different image of them to other brands, um, prob probably, but with the image of Apple is, with the image and the perception of Harley Davidson was when we were talking about that, right? So, so a lot of things are in our control, right? As as we develop a brand concept, and we want that and we like that, but at the end of the day, we have to understand that it's the consumer that interprets what they see and what they experience that will define what a brand actually is, right? So um, there's actually a big area of, um, of, of, of research. Um, it's called the dominant logic um, you know, kind of position where, where value you know, is not created until a customer uses it. So in other words, um, this pen this pen has zero value. Like, you might have made this pen. You might have created this pen. It might have come off your assembly line. But you didn't create any value. 
until somebody uses it. So in other words, the customer has to use it in order for value to be realized. It's like potential energy. Ever see that like in science? Isn't there like kinetic energy? And I don't even know all those energies. I'm not a science. Anybody, somebody might be science in here, right? But it's just sitting there. It's doing nothing until somebody picks it up and uses it, right? That's the, and that's the idea of this, you know, idea of interaction between what we produce in our value proposition and our brand. Our brand exists, but it doesn't have any meaning. Somebody applies a meaning to it, right? So that's kind of the, the important concept behind there. So, you know, again, as we illustrate, there are lots of kind of nuances here in terms of what we can control. Uh, the logos that we use, the color schemes that we use. And again, down below here, we have all different varieties of, you know, think of the script lettering that Kellogg's uses and how utterly unique it is, right? Kellogg, the Kellogg script. You could use that script and write anything. It doesn't have to be Kellogg. You could write something else, but then you look at it and you think Kellogg instantly. Right? Because that script is so, so well defined. In many cases, in Apple's case, you don't even need any words, right? You don't need somebody to write Apple out to know that it's an Apple product because we instinctively have associated that Apple with the brand and the product and the company and so on, right? It's what we have internalized, okay? Um, company letters, like if we have a short name, IBM, um, yeah, IBM, FedEx, uh, Johnson & Johnson, P&G, Procter & Gamble, BMW, Bavarian Motor Works, uh, classic, right? Product names and so on, the numbers and the letters. And so again, all these things we have available to us to develop. And we want to take care to do a good job in doing those things. Here's another example of that idea where we have a script we have a color sequence, and we don't even need the name, but you know instantly, this is what? Snickers. Snickers, right? It really satisfies. Snickers, of course, right? Right, so, so, so that's the power of branding, though. You get to the point, if you've used this color scheme, if you've used your name, if you've used your logo, if you use it often enough in advertising, often enough in the public arena, if you've been consistent in, in using it, right, and associating it with your brand, then people just automatically just kind of know it. It just, it just comes to them, right? And that's, that's a very powerful, powerful kind of concept. Okay, here's some, here are some examples. This is just kind of fun, right? We can have fun, right? Okay, all right, so Toblerone, um, you see the mountain. What else do you see? Yeah. The bear and the mountain, absolutely. Yeah, right, so we're having fun. This is the fun, this is the fun part of class. You never saw the bear. No, I never did either. <laughs> I'll never own see the bear. <laughs> <laughs> it's all you'll see, yeah. I hear, I hear you. This is, this is, what, what do you see in this? Anybody? You see some letters? LSO. LSO, very good. What do they think LSO stands for? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know either. In this particular case, LSO stands for the London Symphony Orchestra. So you can just see the director with their baton in the L and the S and the O. Right. With the baton, right? Just oh, wrong. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Slide? Yeah, I do. Okay. Some other ones that are just going to be for fun, right? The Pittsburgh Zoo, right? Certainly, certainly see see the overlay of, of animals, right? Within within the tree, there are a few. There are a few like this. There's actually another zoo coming up here in a minute. LG. LG, so, so I'm sure you might see or be familiar with the, the smiling, winking face in the L and in the G and in their logo, right? That's kind of there. And this is just creative fun. Right? We can have creation. We 
that one. Now, NBC, I don't think this is their most current logo. It may not be. <clears throat> NBC has changed their logo many times over the years. And without knowing it, Unilever will be somewhat similar to this. Um, the peacock feathers were to represent the different divisions of NBC, the different siloed portions of NBC. At one point, there were six. And so there were six plumes to the peacock's feathers, and each plume represented, each feather represented one of their divisions. So there's some symbolism. Again, we might not recognize that as symbolic. The folks who work there might, right? And we'll see Unilever is kind of similar there as well. Brock Zoo, very, very cool Brock Zoo. We have giraffes and we have birds, but what else do we have? Skyscrapers. Sky skyscrapers, the silhouette of a city, a city scene that's built into, into that logo. Very cool, very interesting. Unilever, again, this is the Unilever example. So the different little icons or images in this U represent different values and different traits and qualities that stand for, and again, this is more of an internal thing, the Unilever brand. It may also include representations of products that are in the Unilever umbrella of products as well. Okay, so it's more of an internal shout out to who they are, what they are, what they do. Right? It's kind of kind of their thing, right? Um, a Hope for African Children's Initiative, so certainly the imagery of silhouetted um, um, child and, and mother or fe female figure within the silhouette of the country or continent, excuse me, um, certainly a cool image to, to share, right? Adidas. Adidas, so Adidas has changed their logo a number of different times, um, but the theory or rationale with this logo is that they are there. Adidas provides the tools for you to overcome obstacles. So the progressive slashes or lines, it represents kind of like a mountain or an obstacle or a challenge to overcome. And who do you want better on your side than Adidas, right? Or Under Armour. Okay. We're an Under Armour school. We are an Under Armour school. That is true. That, that is hundred percent true. Sunlight teams. All right. What do we have next? Audi. 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 Again, internal an internal reference. Internal reference to um, originally the the four four organizations or companies that joined together. Um, to help form Audi, uh, and and so the interlocking um, circles would help represent the interlocking uh, cooperation and interlocking uh, idea of the companies forming together, joining together to form a group. All right. So these are just kind of fun, right? A little bit of, but I hope they stress this idea that a great deal of thought can go into. The meaning and kind of what's happening behind the scenes with the logo. And when logos are created and they start to form the identity of the company or identity of the brand, they can be very long lasting. You can remember these for a long, long time. And that's, you know, you don't want to have to remember all kinds of stuff uh, when a symbol or a logo will help you kind of go through that thinking process faster. It's like a cue or a heuristic. When we see, when we see a brand, um, it represents a whole bunch of information, and that's what we, that's what we kind of think of, it, think of it as. Okay, so we had two, I hope you had opportunities to skim through and or deeply read these two short articles tonight. Right, Carolina Blue. North Carolina. Anybody a North Carolina fan? Awesome. Anybody a Duke fan? Awesome! All right. Now, they both have blue in their color, right? Both, both schools, both universities 
are blue, are they not? But you get in a lot of trouble if you walked around UNC's campus with Duke's blue. Wouldn't you? The blue devils, right? And vice versa, probably. Isn't that true? Anybody agree with me on this? Anybody Anybody know anything about basketball? Or Yeah, I mean... I mean, I had a little bit. Oh, well, I was wondering, maybe. <laughs> I like once or twice. Yeah, once or twice. Chip watch, right? I was Chip and I was... Walk. Yeah. Good shots. Good shots. All right. So, um, so how important? So, tell me a little bit about what, what, why would a school, why would anybody go so far as to protect their color as much as North Carolina does theirs? Anybody? Branding. Okay, but why? Why would people care? Why would they care? Okay, pride. Well, it's nice as color. Like people be releasing like sneakers with this. It'd be like the color way of North Carolina. <clears throat> okay, so so in the marketplace. Uh, something as simple as color could differentiate one product from another. Now, said like someone might call it like sneakers, yeah. like shoes. If we have Carolina blue, um, then that's going to sell differently. It could be unique, right? As opposed to any other shade of blue. Anybody familiar with the, with Alabama? University of Alabama, not the state. University. Yeah. Um, what? what? I can't roll time. Roll. Yeah. <laughs> so, but what, what, what? The Alabama. Hi. Now, interestingly, Alabama's crimson, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, is the exact same Pantone as Oklahoma's red. It's true. And it's kind of sad, right? I mean, would be in North Carolina. Yeah, but getting back to North Carolina, what what was their issue? Why did they, what was prompting them to be so focused on their color of blue? It was in the article. I know the yeah. problem was like the color was just hard to maintain on TV and like for the laundry or something. Too, I think for the uniforms, okay. but then everyone was like upset because they associate um, UNC with you know the Carolina blue. Yeah. So they want to see that color, not like some gray or some teal. You know. So so as the um, in the advent of color television, in in, in availability in homes, along with the Increased television, um, you know, playing the playing through to the NCAA tournament through the sixties and the seventies. Um, North Carolina was on TV more and more and more and more. Technology of television reception, color TVs being viewed, and the recording and transmission of the actual imagery distorted the color. So what they ended up doing was adapting and changing and tweaking the color of the uniform so that when people saw them on TV, it would be truer to Carolina blue. So it's like reality and what we see on TV aren't almost the same thing. Is that right? Right? It's all about this idea of creating a brand that's distinctive and that's unique. Again, I can't emphasize this enough. No one would want to, I mean, if you're in the the Tri-City area, the Triangle, the Research Triangle, you would never want to make that faux pas of having Duke on a powder blue, North Carolina blue shirt, right? Can you imagine how, how that would be? That would be, that'd be just devastating for, for those folks. No, it would be, right? I mean, to, I mean you can track it to any other, any other brand though, that has a following, that has a fan base. So when we talk about branding, 
you know, there's this affinity that people have to like the products that they buy. And um, it extends it extends to the type of restaurants you go to, the type of clothes you wear, the brands of clothes that you wear, the brands of restaurants that you go to, the brand of car that you drive, and things like that. Even to the point where, you know, we're so accustomed to this idea of a sports team community, the, the, the sports nation term. You know, that nation term that, that's used there where it's a group of people who are you know, fans of a sports team. It also translates, though, to fans of any other product category as well. I mean, there are fans of ivory soap. There are fans of, we know, we know, there are fans of Apple. There are fans of um, Schwinn bicycles. There are fans of all kinds of things, right? So this idea of like, like the protection, the, the protection of your brand asset is actually a really big deal, right? So now, what did Nike do? Who did Nike collaborate with? Jordan. Well, yeah, I guess, right? Yeah, Nike. Yeah. Nike. Michael Jordan went there too, right? Uh, so collaborated with Nike to create and to sort of put their official stamp on a Pantone color that they would call Carolina Blue. So now, A, it's kind of a cool story. B, you can only, you know, using this color, you know, means something above and beyond kind of what, what you would normally, normally do. Or normally have in it. Um, and you can leverage that and have a Carolina blue Nike shoe um, and it could be convenient. Okay, now let's shift gears a little bit since you're 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 all on top of Carolina blue. Uh, play like a champion today. Is anybody familiar with that phrase before reading that article? Anybody? Play like a champion today. I heard it for like context of Notre Dame, but crazy story. Our, so the University of Notre Dame, right, up in northern Indiana. Right? There's not much to do in northern Indiana. I've been there, but you know, other than maybe go to Michigan. But you probably don't want to do that, especially if you're going to Notre Dame or whatever. All right, play like a champion today. Lou Holtz uh, won a couple national Two national titles? Two. 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 All right. Lou Holtz, um, you know, kind of had this idea or had seen a reference in some books. Play like a champion today. You have not heard, so some of you have never heard that saying before. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Um, so what happened in this article? What happened to this phrase? What, what's the story behind this? You alluded to it. It was, it was um, basically like the phrase, play like a champion today. Um, like Notre Dame was trying to like push it and like brand it, make it like, um, what's the word? Like, for, um, word. and then Oklahoma was like, said that they sort of used it before Notre Dame and had been using it in their in the context of their sports teams well before, so it was kind of like an argument over who owned the rights for it. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Well, who does own the rights to it? A company buy it. Yes. Who, who runs the company? There's a club, play like a champion, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, who runs the company? Who owns the company? Sign Well, they, they buy it from Revolts, isn't that funny? So back in the back in the eighties, eighties sign up inside Notre Dame Stadium, right around the, maybe a decade later, I guess they signed their NBC deal in ninety one. I think they signed their NBC deal and started to get more publicity, and that sign started to become famous, and now. Anywhere you go, you'll see something like a champion. 
not just play like a champion, study like a champion, or whatever like a champion. It's a catchphrase. It's a catchphrase, right? And so it's a real popular phrase. So something you might know about uh, Notre Dame, they are independent. They, there's a private university. They're independent. They are not in a conference. They're not in a football conference. They're not, they are in the ACC for other sports. Um, I don't know what they compete in in hockey, but I know in all their other sports they're ACC. But in football, they're independent. They, they like to think that they do things their own. They also are extremely brand-focused and protective. I don't know if you realize this. The University of Notre Dame this last year, they commissioned, and they now have their official University of Notre Dame smell. They do. I kid you not. You can buy candles. Yeah, they, they actually, there are a number of buildings in uh, on campus where they have the scent drifting through the air vents. It's true. It's a true story. This is like only a Notre Dame story. This is, this is how protective they are. They, they, they have these things like, you know, the dome. They have one center building that has a big dome. It's a gold dome. And, and the, 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 the tradition is that there are little flakes of gold that come off the dome, and they use it on the helmets for the football team. So all kinds of crazy stories like that. They're extremely protective of their brand, though. It's like they will guard it with their life. So the, an illustration of this, though, is the story about the slogan. Right? This is just kind of like one little, one little illustration of how protective they are. So Lou Holtz, in the 80s, head football coach, wins a couple titles, um, puts this sign up as a motivator for his team, doesn't really think anything about it. Um, in the early 90s, because Notre Dame is independent, they were the first, um, I may be wrong, but I don't think so, first uh, major, made first, first school, university school, sports entity at the college level to sign their own media rights deal with NBC. Exclusive deal to broadcast NBC, on NBC, Notre Dame, sports events. So this sign starts getting publicized, kind of, you know, through this deal, through through this, and yeah, Oklahoma, they're like, well, no, that's ours. That's ours. But they never claimed it. And that's the thing, right? Moreover, nobody nobody knew about it except for the team. They really wouldn't know about it, basically. It wasn't knowledge outside of them. So they didn't popularize it. They didn't claim it. And so somebody else did, obviously, and, um, and the rest is kind of the rest is kind of history. Right. So, 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 as trivial as it may seem, when we start talking about the color of your brand, it translates into enormous costs and expenses um, in terms of what the brand value becomes, right? And what the identity of the of the actual product. Um, will be and what what people think about it. So down the road, when you see that phrase, play like a champion, you'll associate it with that story in the university. When you see that 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 Carolina blue blue that that powder blue look, you'll associate it with with the university. All right. So those are fun examples. I like those a lot. I like to think about those a lot. Um, at the end of the day, though, there's a lot of psychology that happens behind this brand customer relationship that happens, that interaction. A lot of it is driven by what we call brand associations. And so there's, again, this associative uh, network theory that is out there where um, when we see something like a logo or a color and we see it in the context of something else, we form a connection between those two things. We associate that logo or that color with something. So if you have this affinity for North Carolina, you think of North Carolina basketball as super successful, super um, you know, popular, a lot of national championships. 
when you see that North Carolina blue, you associate winning with it. You'll make that connection, right, oftentimes. So brand associations now are things that we kind of think about, and associations can happen in a lot of different ways, right? So as, as I illustrate here, um, we assign some type of meaning to some of these items that you wouldn't otherwise think would make sense. But they end up being very important. We might assign product quality or product features. Um, bows, speakers have always been, and for many, many, many years, the kind of the pinnacle in terms of sound quality. Walmart, you might associate a lot of things with Walmart. Some of them might be negative, right? But you probably associate low prices with Walmart because that's where they're positioned in the marketplace. When you see their logo or see their name, that might be something that we, we, we think of. BMW is always a brand that we think of as sophisticated, but also very well kind of engineered, precision engineered, well, well designed. Those types of things are probably ideas you associate with that brand. And these are brand associations, right? Other product at attributes could happen here as well. Um, again, part of the identity of the brand, uh, the packaging might lend themselves to association to a product or a brand. When you see Pringles, that can, that canister, right, that canister is very unique in that space, in that product category, right, in the chips and snack space. Canisters like that are, are rare. And so, and as the originator of that type of tube for their product, that's what we associate with that. Right? So there's lots of ways we can kind of make these connections. And that's exactly what we do um, when we start forming connections and, and, and things like that. Uh, emotional benefits would be an, a third type of a big category here. And these are probably some of the most important, right? We want an emotional bond. But what exactly gets triggered when you see a logo? What emotional bond do you have with it? Is it like warm feelings? Is it a sense of confidence? Is it ruggedness? Is it a personality trait? Um, what, would it, what would it look like for your brand? When people hear your brand, what do they associate? What do they think of? And what do they connect with as far as that goes? So this whole associate network theory is based on this idea that associations are, are made and, and those are, those are Generally, generally good things. Um, can we always control what those feelings are? Nope, not always. Because again, remember, um, we have to we have to be able to um, let the customer make those associations. It's oftentimes not. It's oftentimes not us. Okay, so connections between brands, right? Um, there, there is an idea that. Um, you make one connection and then subsequent connections can happen afterwards, kind of like in a network. So I'm gonna show you an illustration here in just a second. Uh, but your strongest feelings about the brand get retrieved first, um, and then other feelings come after after that. So again, just kind of a, 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 a illustration here, if you will. Um, if we start at the very top and we hear the brand name Name Crest or maybe Colgate or whatever toothpaste you want to choose. Say Crest in this particular case. You might associate with Crest Crest's products, right? What do you know Crest as? Well, it's a toothpaste. Um, you may know maybe it's a mouthwash. Maybe it's the, the Crest white strips as well. So those are retrieved first. Those are the concepts that you associate most closely with that brand. So you think of them first. Then you may think, and this might not be something that you're conscious about, but what you might associate with toothpaste and with white strips are other concepts here. Fresh breath, super white teeth, Good checkups. Somewhere between good checkups, we have other influencers like the mom and the dentist who are telling them to you know, brush your teeth because you want to have good, good checkups, right? 
There's also expensive up there. You know, that might be, again, it's an association that you have with those white strips. Um, and it might not be wrong. It may not be the association I want you to have, but it's the association that you may draw uh, after you have experience with, with this product. And that kind of goes on from there, right? It kind of spreads out to other associations relating to other people, um, other aspects of target control, want to be successful, sex appeal, want to be more attractive, reaching a new person in class. You see the people are kind of in the, in, in the, the salmon colored ones there. Uh, but the whole point is that this is a network of associations of thoughts that could be triggered over time by the reference to a brand element. In this case, the name. Does it have to be the name? No, nope. it can be a color scheme. Again, it can be a logo. It can be any one of the elements that we use to form, um, form our brand. Okay, so kind of a cool area, right? You really want to think about why people are attracted, sometimes irrationally, to products. Sometimes track it back to their affinity towards a brand or the brand image or the, the elements of a brand. You know, you could think of um, maybe a brand and it just brings excitement to you um, or fun or, 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 or something like that. And that's what we want to try to get to as we think about um, brands. Okay, cool. All right, a couple more things and we'll probably take a little bit of a break uh, because we've been kind of out of here for a little bit. Um, so there is a model that you could apply when it comes to this idea of creating brand identity. What does your brand represent? What does it stand for? What is its, what is it, right? What does it mean for a customer? And so this is Capfer's brand identity prism. Okay, and I'm gonna talk about each of these areas. There is a, um, and, and this is more, sometimes I do this, know where it is, there's a, there's a reference piece in Moodle if you want a little bit more description of this model. So you can dig into that if you'd like to look at this a little bit more. Um, but this is like a managerial tool um, that you can use to evaluate a brand and brand identity. There are six different dimensions here, um, six different components, um, and there's a couple different sort of dimensions. If we look up and down, up at the top, we look at this idea that this is the firm or the organization or the brand's perspective. Down below is the customer or the receiver's perspective, okay? And then on one side, I can't remember if it's left or right. On one side, the, the left-hand side are external kind of components, and on the right side are internal components. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about some of these. One, we'll just start external at the firm level is physique or physical um, identity features. Okay, so uh, if you're evaluating a brand, think about what is its packaging like? What is what are some distinctive features? I just mentioned Pringles. Pringles has a very distinctive canister, and that would be part of its distinguishing notion, you know, facts or, or elements that let it stand out from others on that aisle in the store. Right? But physical features or characteristics, Apple products, they all kind of look the same. They're sleek, they're fast, you know, they, they all have kind of the curve. They're, they're actually based off of a, you know, one designer's um, pattern. Um, so they all kind of look the same. Okay, but that's sort of identity of the product or the brand. Okay, staying up top, personality. Okay, we'll talk about brand personality very briefly in a second. Um, there's a big area of research where we study the personality traits you would assign a brand. Is a brand happy? Is it friendly? Is it helping? Is it caring? Is it rugged? Is it tough? Is it ambitious? Is it um, innovative? Is it, is it, you know, any human trait 
that you can think of that kind of describe the personality, we could do research, we could measure that in, in terms of a brand. So brand personality, okay? So that's what's its character like. That's a dimension that we can use. Now, that's internal. Okay? That's not as much external, that's more internal. Okay? Personality. Culture, all right. Model describes the brand's kind of like moral outlook, like ethics, you know, kind of does it do the right thing? What does it stand for socially? Patagonia has a lot of this, this category covered, right? Um, and, and kind of like what is its moral compass is basically the idea of that cultural dimension. What values and guiding principles exist for that brand? This is kind of crazy, isn't it? You're like creating the person out of the brand, but that's what you're doing. Okay. Down below, we're going to have the, the quadrant there that has, it's, it's the receiver or it's the uh, customer, and it's their self-image. Right. So now, this is actually another area where we do a ton of study where we look to pair a customer self-image to that of the brands. So like take the customer self-image and the brand's personality and see if they go together, right? A lot of thought it exists in this area where you as a customer will try to buy products and brands that reflect your personality and your image. I don't know, you don't think so? Huh? Yeah. You, you don't agree? I'm sorry, I just... Uh, sorry. I got carried away. You, yeah, I know. I, I get carried away sometimes, too. No worries. So, but personality, right? The personality of the consumer matches the personality of the brand. That's what we think of self-image. Okay. Reflection. All right. This is an interesting one because it's exactly what it says. The customers who use the product reflect the brand. So let's analyze the customers who use the product, and that will give us a mirror image of what the brand really is. And okay, so this is a, so this one. The example I use for this is almost always, and I, I hate to do it all the time, but the Harley Davidson rider. If you can picture the Harley Davidson consumer, they reflect the brand. They reflect that brand so well that that's the reflection of the. And that would be captured in this in this image here. So who, who do you portray as the target group for your brand? Who uses your brand? Okay, the last one is, and so this is this is this is um, external, these are external reflections of the brand, but the last one is relationship. And the notion here is that how strong of a relationship should you have and do you have with your brand's uh, community and with the individuals who use your product? Okay. If you're a product that's very like out in the general masses, if this is open to the generic public, people like anybody can use your product, you're probably not going to have a real deep, close relationship with, with your individual consumers. <clears throat> if, on the other hand, you have a product that is catered to or personalized or customized you know, to the marketplace, you're going to have a much stronger relationship. So this might actually extension of that CRM that we talked about earlier in the term. Um, and it would be reflected here in this little quadrant. Okay, so again, this is the, the, this is Capfer's brand identity prism. Um, there are, in the PowerPoints, there are a number of different, I'm going to go through, I'm just going to zip through these because, um, you know, kind of want, in the interest of time, if nothing else. Um, there, there, there's a number of different illustrations of this. You can go online and find lots of illustrations of this, too, if you want some case studies. Um, if you want to do this on your own, you can certainly do this. Dove soap. Um, Dove. Now, I don't know if you've ever used Dove soap or opened up a Dove soap you know, box or whatever. The soap is contoured. It's shaped. It's rounded. It's smooth. It, it's soft, right? It has, a, so the physical elements of the actual product are unique, right, in and of themselves. The physical picture reflects what they want the brand and the image to be, what they want you to think about. 
personality. If you were to call it a personality, if you said, if it was a person and you were going to describe it, how would you do it? Well, they would like to think natural, soft, and friendly as, as a product. Are they natural? Are they soft? Are they friendly? I'm not sure natural or soft or personality traits. Are I guess they are, right? Um, culture. Remember, culture deals with the principles that guide the brand, right? Trust. No stereotypes, down to earth. You know, this has a lot of personalities, but they're cultural. I guess, I guess they're the principles that are moving on. Okay, self-image of the users, of the customers. The self-image, so the self-image of the customers, confident, beautiful, inspired. Um, right. So there's going to need to be a lot of synergy on the on the right hand side here for this to work. Right. For customers to see themselves with the brand. They have to be in line on the left. Okay. Who uses this? Natural, confident, modern women. So the brand, so the users reflect the image that the brand has. So the users would have these traits. This part of a nice little market segment process, right? So who would we go after to position our product towards? Natural, confident, modern women. Um, because they reflect our brand. They, they are the personification, the true personification of who we are. And then what types of relationships are we talking about? Close, close relationships. Um, we want people to feel confident, uh, distinct, um, special in all those different things. Right? And so that's one example. There are other examples. Ferrari, right? Lots of, lots of imagery here. Again, physical uh, the physique, the image, the logo, the color scheme, personality, classy, ambitious, athletic, culture, luxury, Italian. I don't know if these are guiding principles or not. You have to work on those a little bit. Self-image, elite. They want to be the best of the user. The user's self-image. Reflection, <coughs> who uses this product. Wealthy, middle-aged men expressing their social status. And the type of relationship you know, the type of relationship they want to have with their customers is a close, exclusive, high-level bond, right? A really tight relationship, really a lot, of, a lot of interaction with each other. Okay, so this is kind of a cool idea to conceptualize a very, very complex, you know, notion called brand. Like, what is a brand? Why is it important? Why do we have it? Uh, this is a good way to start. So this segment, uh, we're really just talking about brand identity, like what elements go into an identity, and how that identity interrelates or inter interacts with the customer, customer's perception. Okay. Do y'all have any questions? Yes. Do um, companies go through branding to like find customers that fit the picture of the receiver, or are they looking for customers that better? the pictures of themselves? That's a great question. Um, it's kind of like, which comes first, the chicken or, or, or the egg? So oftentimes, a company has its DNA. It's who they are. It's what they are. And they're going to form their product, and they're going to form their brand, and they're going to do what they're going to do. Patagonia's chief uh, started in the 50s and the 60s, and he was going to do his company the way he wanted to do it. Um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, and that formed the ethos of the company, and the customers followed. They made that. Now, could you fabricate a brand to match a market space? Um, that's a good question. And I'm trying to think of some examples. I'm sure you can. I'm sure you can. Um, be disingenuous. Not to, and I, I, I should be careful because I'm not a cynic in any way, but I've got to believe that when politicians look at voters, they change to match voter interests sometimes. Maybe that's too pessimistic, right? But now, can we do that with customer, 
with products? Can we look at a lucrative customer market segment and then create a brand that is uniquely created just for that market segment? Um, yeah, of course we can. Um, so when Dr. Pepper created Baja Blast, they created Baja Blast for a very specific market segment. They uh, coordinated Baja Blast with Taco Bell and Doritos and have created an entire kind of thing that is exclusively for a group of consumers. Does that make sense? So, yeah, 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 yeah. So, I mean, I'm working this through because it's a fantastic question, right? Um, but if you're like an entrepreneur and you're starting a business, it, you know, you kind of got to do what you do well. You got to do your strengths, right? And if your strengths are engineering, then you're going to be known for engineering. If your strengths are for something else, then that's what you'll probably be known for. And that's the market that will gravitate to you most likely, is my guess. That's a great question, though. Cool. What else? Well, it's branding, 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 brand managers, right? The textbook, we don't do it a lot right now, just FYI, we're going to take a break here in just a second. The textbook also spends some time talking about managing brands through the product life cycle. We're actually going to do that here in another couple of weeks when we do product development and product uh, portfolio management. So there are some pieces in the text that you'll read um, that you won't necessarily talk about this week, but we will come in. All right, let's, 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 uh, let's jump into a little bit of branding. So we talked about like, the idea of creating, creating brand elements and how brand elements um, brand, they also help make connections with customers and help bond a customer uh, through associated properties or processes uh, to the brand itself. But very importantly, and maybe even more important, you know, from an internal marketing perspective, like why we do this, um, and where the world will be through brands create value um, both for the customer but also for the firm as well. So um, this value that brands create for the firm we call brand equity. It's a term that we use, make lots of efforts to try to measure brand equity. It's very difficult to measure, but we know it exists um, and there are some ways that we can capture at least its effects if nothing else. So um, brand equity, the set of, this is kind of a technical way to describe it, set of assets and liabilities, if you want to think of equity from, <coughs> from a, an accounting perspective, equity is related to assets and liabilities, linked to the brand's name and symbol that adds to or subtracts from the value provided by a product or service to a firm or that firm's customers. Okay, so there are other reasons other than to create these bonds and create impressions and, and all this other stuff. It's, it comes down to value and money. And here's the deal. If you go to buy a company, you're going to pay for its assets. You're going to pay for what it, it owns. You're going to pay also um, a value for future revenue future growth, future contracts. You also pay something for the name of the company itself, right? And that name, so how much is it worth? How much is that name worth? In some cases, the entire value of the company is tied up in its name and its brand. You buy a brand because you want its customer, you want its logo, you want its name, right? And so on and so forth. So, so brands have an economic value to, to the company itself. So we'll look at this concept of equity kind of from three different perspectives. Um, one is not used at all. 
the other the others are used quite a bit so um, from a financial accounting perspective one way to think about or explain this concept of brand equity uh, would be exactly that from a liability and an asset and then and, and an equity perspective okay so financial performance profitability and such um, is captured by um, a lot of times by investors. I mean, how much a firm is worth is often uh, reflected by how much somebody's willing to pay for it. So this view of equity, again, I've only seen it referenced a couple times, and so it's really hard to conceptualize and track. It's even more difficult to try to measure because there's really this, this, this liability concept doesn't really exist in this space. And we don't really have a measure for things that take away value from brand, uh, brand related elements. You could say that a liability, a brand liability might be if the brand screws up and you get some bad press and you get some people who have negative associations with the brand, that would be a liability, I suppose. But again, it's not really how we think about measuring things. So that's one challenge with this view of brand equity, but I just wanted to put it out there. And the little picture kind of explains it. On the left, you have the traditional view of how we would look at equity um, from an accounting perspective. Take the company's assets, you take away liabilities, and what's left is owner's equity. Well, what if we did the same thing with the brand? We took all the brand assets, which would include its name, its logo, its image, its, and we put a value to that, and then we took out of that value detractors of the brand. Whatever we would have left over would be equity. Now, this is very theoretical. Like I said, it's not something we do not measure equity this way, but it could be conceptualized this way if this, is, if this helps, if it helps you understand brand equity. Okay, so this is one perspective, um, not one we would typically uh, associate. Second perspective, which brand equity is measured a lot of, of in a lot of ways, um, is an outcome or performance-based Perspective. Now, this is very reflective, right? So, you know you have brand equity if lots of things that are on this that are on this page itself. Um, something called a price premium. So, um, if if you took a generic product, if you took a generic pair of sneakers, and you took a Nike pair of sneakers, and the products looked the same except one was generic and one was Nike. How much more would people be willing to pay for the Nike as opposed to the generic? Right? That's called a price premium. That additional amount people would be willing to pay is a price premium. And what we do is we associate that price premium with the value of the brand or brand equity. So if we're going to measure how valuable brand is, this is one way we can do it. Right? So this is an outcome base, so that's that, that'd be a price premium. Brands that are stronger will demand a higher price premium. You can charge more for a more valuable brand than you can a less valuable brand. Other outcomes, switching behaviors. So people who are people who are customers of strong brands are less likely to switch. Again, uh, generic versus a branded product, people will switch off of a generic brand to another brand very easily. If you're brand loyal, then you won't. You'll, you'll stay with it. Positive word of mouth. You know, these are, again, our outcomes. These are things that we would measure. Strong brands, brands with strong <coughs> brand equity have lots of positive word of mouth. Um, you might call it brand sentiment. Um, so if the sentiment is positive, uh, which would be the net difference between bad things and good things being said about your brand, brand sentiment is positive net. Then, then you'd have a stronger brand. Um, strong brands have a um, sizable amount of control in channels. So look, if I have a strong brand, distributors want to carry my brand. Retailers want to carry my brand. If I have a strong brand, right? 
So we can measure that. We can measure the degree to which suppliers want my brand versus my competitors. If suppliers want my brand more than they want my competitors' brands, I have a stronger brand, right? Kind of, kind of makes sense. Um, and also, what type of competitive positioning, market share, category leader type of metrics do we have? And these are like outcome-based indicators that you have brand equity. All right, so we, we, we're coming down to this like, okay, you, you have a name, people recognize it, but what value does that have to the firm? Well, you know, if we have all of these traits, these all lead to positive financial outcomes, every one of them, right? So that's how it contributes to the bottom of my, the, the bottom line of my firm, okay? So these are all things that we do use a lot to measure uh, the power of a brand, strength of a brand. The last set of kind of items here that we would use is called customer-based brand equity. It's like the model, it's a model, customer-based brand equity features. And these are ones where we ask customers directly or we refer to customers directly and measure their attitudes towards brands more than anything else. So this is that connection of what the customer thinks about the brand and different dimensions of how they think about the brand. Do they trust the brand? Are they, you mentioned it already, loyal to the brand? Do they feel that the brand is credible and believable? Those are all, these are all elements that lead to high brand equity. Um, is, the, is the quality perceived to be good? Are there strong brand associations? So when we do brand associations here as well, are the things you associate with the brand positive? Like, like I know, I, I heard the brand's name, I think certain things about the brand triggers memories and associations. Are those positive? One of the associations was that Crest White Strips were expensive. That might not be viewed as a positive thing. And so that might, right, but, but what are the positive things? Those are brand associations. Brand awareness, hugely important. We measure brand awareness is an enormously important uh, metric that we measure every day, all the time, and it helps us understand how strong the brand is. Reputation and overall attitude towards the brand. You feel positive towards it or not. Yeah. Okay, so CBBE, uh, customer based brand equity. Um, it, there's a whole list of measures we use. Um, and here's the thing we could do some research and we could use these measures for our brand. They only really matter though when we start using them for other brands too and compare our scores to our competitors. So this is a very um, type of thing um, that, 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 that works out to be if we use this particular thing. Now, does it certainly have an impact on how much the brand is worth and the value of the brand? Of course, right? If, you're, if you score high on all of these, you will be a more valuable economic in, you know, you know, entity than what your competitors, your competitors certainly are. Okay, um, so the differences then between the brands and between between you know kind of these measures are, are absolutely the things that we want to want to kind of kind of think about as we move forward. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the example again, price premium exam. I have a couple different illustrations of this. Um, how much are you willing to pay for the brand? Again, this is just kind of like in a survey, we would do this, we would name a brand, but then we would also have an illustration of a brand uh, that's not named or a, a product that's not named, a generic version of that. How much are you willing to pay for gas at a specific branded location versus another? Here's another one that we do when we do likelihood to buy. Well, we'll, we'll give two different price points um, or, or we have a price point with two different brands and we'll measure likelihood to buy. So you can think about the second example um, and say, well, look, um, what are the results? 
if 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 um, seventy five percent of the market's willing to buy the Sony at this price, but only fifty five percent of the market's willing to buy the unknown brand at this price, how much more valuable than is Sony, right? Just simply because it's on the product and it's their product, and you get everything that you get with a Sony. That's that's the indicator. That's kind of this idea of measuring differences between brands. Um, just to give some historical perspective, um, Kantar, Kantar with a K, Kantar is a brand research company. Every single year they put out a brand report. Um, so I went ahead and their 2023 brand report, and I posted it on Moodle for you. So if you're interested in a deep dive on brand values by Kantar, you can, you can look that up if you're interested, um, and they track brand value over, over time. So if in 2011, 2017, you know, brands kind of shift around and they move, but um, you're talking pretty high brand values, um, and, and again, you know, if you're going to buy these companies, oftentimes what, what these companies would be, um, how value the brand aspect that these companies are. Moving forward from 17 to 20, we're going to see a little bit more shifting, but some of the same characters around. Um, I think McDonald's dropped out here, but it'll come back again. Uh, here again, um, and then we move forward to, to now. Uh, this year, top five brands, brand values in the world. These are global brands, of course. Uh, capped off by Apple, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and McDonald's is never far out of the top five. They're always usually in the top ten. Um, and, you know, think about the Golden Arches. Think about that brand. Coca-Cola is also usually in the top ten every year um, as well. So, so this is kind of like this brand value thing, um, which has an economic value to the bottom line of the company. Um, I just threw this together just to kind of give an illustration of how, um, again, they kind of move and around. These top four brands existed, in, and they were in the top five all each year, except, no, I think they were. Amazon might not have been early on, but it has been since. Okay, so this is a competitive concept. This is, a, this is one way that firms compete with each other is to put an enormous amount of energy bless me, in protecting their elements, which then, again, translate into something that the customer, customer deals with. Okay, cool. Yeah, brand equity, we go on for a really long time measuring brand equity. But I just want you to get this idea, kind of understand the concept of it, because it really is something that, that is important. All right, and this is going to kind of lead us into this last portion of tonight. We're going to talk a little bit about positioning. So the three typically follow. We do uh, segmenting. Then we identify segments that we want to pursue in targeting. And then once we've identified one or more segments we want to pursue, um, we often want to create a plan that will bring our brand to that market, to that segment. And that's called positioning. Right? So positioning is all about the idea of like creating an image of our product in the minds of the consumer. We want the consumer um, to think that our product is for them. We want to advertise to them. We want to make the product itself cater to them, customized to them. We want to distribute the product to them, and so on and so forth. At the same time, though, we have to be able to create distinctions between what we offer and what our competitors offer. Right. So that's what positioning is all about. It's this idea of taking shot of where our product lies relative to our competition in the minds of the consumers that are out there, right? And, and leveraging that, kind of thinking about how that goes. So we've got to determine um, what markets we're going to serve and ultimately, you know, kind of where we're going to be. This, 
this is actually is kind of this idea that if we are using differentiation as the tool of competition, then you would be following what's called a differentiation orientation, and that would be your strategy. Not all companies do this. Some companies, again, follow like a cost basis where they want to compete on cost um, or some other things like that. But if your idea of competition is we're going to highlight the things we do well and we're going to leverage those compared to our competitors, then you're using a differentiation um, orientation to, to, to kind, of, kind of do this, right? Um, so, you know, again, think about where those points of difference come from and what, what those might, might actually be, all right? So um, intersecting between us and what we do well and what the customer wants is exactly what we'll end up doing here, right? So if your market segment, like we looked at market segments earlier, one was kind of a market segment, maybe they wanted healthy food, maybe another market segment wanted more atmosphere. Okay, so what if we're that restaurant that has a lot of atmosphere? Well, the market segment we're going to be positioned towards best will be that market segment, right? right what if we're that restaurant that has lots of healthy options? We put out a lot of new products and new things every week. We're going to attract the health indicator, right? That's the type of customer that we're going to position ourselves towards. So think about this as kind of like a strategic thing we have some control over. We decide how we're going to like serve that customer. We need to be able to do so in a way that, that makes sense for them. So positioning then takes it advantage of or takes into account the customer's sort of kind of their needs, their wants, their interests. Um, but you know, it also you know, implies that we're going to be able to place ourselves in their space that makes sense. Okay, so um, some of the ways that we do this, we've talked about these already. Points of difference that actually matter a lot to customers often fall in these grouped areas. Number one, most most in, in foremost, um, price, right? Customers drive by price, like price-driven customers are a big deal. When you see perceptual maps, we'll look at a few in a minute, um, oftentimes price and quality are the two things that, that people look at the most, okay? So price, no doubt about that. Um, the quality, whether it's product quality or service quality, um, and how that's perceived, absolutely. Numbers of product features, product attributes. Um, like when you're looking to buy a car, some people um, look at horsepower. Some people look at um, how many doors it has. Some people look at how much space it has inside. Some people look at how many different color options there are. Right? Those are all product features and benefits. And if those are important to the customer, then it might be something that you integrate into, into what you do. Um, other elements, performance-related, durability, um, those types of things, all features that you could differentiate yourself on. Remember this idea of product personalities? Sometimes we do um, perceptions, we, 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 we position our product by personality. Um, yeah, I can't think of a good example, but um, yeah, it happens from time to time. Other things that we can do, locations and things like that. So lots of different ways we can think of to differentiate our product and bring our product closer to the customer. So let's talk a little bit then about developing a positioning strategy. Um, one of the takeaways here from a managerial standpoint is defining what you will be good at and who you will try to reach. So sometimes companies will make a one or two sentence statement called a positioning statement, which will be kind of the order that they use to move forward and create their marketing plan with. Right? So you can do something like this, and this could be as long and lengthy and detailed as you want, but I just have kind of a framework put up here. So what we do first is identify our target market. 
like our market segment. This market segment, and include the profile if you want, describe who they are, the healthy innovators. The healthy innovator market segment, right, should buy, what should they buy? Well, they should come to our restaurant. They should, they should buy our products, they should buy, um, whether it's a specific product or our brand, they should use our services, right? So we want them to do something with this. Rather than, and we fill in our competitors, we need to know our competitors and, our, and their strengths and the things that they do. Why should they buy ours? Well, for whatever distinctive, you know, reason we want we, we create so the healthy innovators should buy our you know come to our restaurant for lunch as opposed to this restaurant and this restaurant and this restaurant because we offer extremely healthy lunch options that rotate every week and <coughs> always offer something new on the menu so like okay, so I'm like honing in on the key the key things that healthy innovators are going to want, right? I'm going to leverage those items because I know that's what they want, but I also know that's what I can do. That's my strength, and that's where I have an ability to to outperform my competitors. Now, what this means is that I might become too focused in one area, I need to be careful about, or one market, I need to be careful about uh, becoming over-positioned. But at the same time, if I want to be competitive in that market segment, this is what I might have to do. Right now, this is, again, as a marketing manager, you kind of have to decide that scope and that position that you want to, you want to engage in, that you want to be in. Okay, so I mentioned this term over position. So let's say I have a really, really narrow target, a really narrow space, and I put all my eggs in one basket, and I go after them, and boom, um, I focus only on them, and as I only focus on them, nobody else wants me. Now, if I did that, that would be that that would be a problem, right? That could be potentially a problem. And we call that actually over positioning. I know I did that, did, did that second instead of under position, but that'd be over positioning. Okay, so you gotta be careful a little bit about that. The opposite of that is when you don't identify any market segment and you're just kind of like, who is this brand for? It's not for me, it's not for you. It's who is it for? Imagine a brand, bless you, that doesn't define themselves at all and doesn't position themselves at all towards any market. Who's it for? That's, 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 and what actually ends up happening is the market like looks at that brand like, well, they're not for me. I don't know who they're for. And everybody says, if everybody says that brand's really not for me, then you know you're in trouble, right? You know, you know you're in super, super big, big trouble. And you haven't positioned yourself in an aggressive way at all. You can be over-aggressive or you can be too under-aggressive. And that's where those two failures kind of, kind of come into play. A um, couple other positioning errors that can come into play here, just uh, the, 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 the confused or, out, or doubtful positioning places. Um, so when a confused positioning is when you make multiple claims that contradict each other. All right, so let's say I want to be the healthy food choice, and on my menu, I feature lots of fried, greasy food. Oh, does that make sense? Does that make sense? I mean, am I, I'm positioning myself as the healthy option in all my advertising, so I have all these health nuts coming in, and they're fried this, fried that, grease here, right? going on? I mean, my mix, my product mix, everything that I'm doing doesn't really match what I'm trying to create in terms of my brand, my positioning. It just doesn't work. 
And that's, con that's a confused position, I think. So, so there's this kind of execution piece that comes into play. The last one deals with, the last positioning that we'll talk about deals with uh, doubtful positioning. When the market doesn't believe you. When you try to be something you're not, but you know the market wants. They don't believe you. And trust me, customers, we're all there. Right? Do you always believe companies you hear from, the brands that are out there, don't deliver. Now, you have to have some confidence that the product will deliver what it says it's going to deliver, but if they don't believe them, uh, if you don't believe them, or they're not believable, then that's, then that's simply, a, simply a problem, doubtful positioning. Um, yeah, it used to be like car brands do this from time to time and can make a transition Kia and some other brands were always viewed as kind of a low quality, expensive, low quality vehicle. But now they're kind of like more expensive, they're better quality type, type things. But that transition happened very slowly over time. If they tried to make a leap quickly um, from one position of quality to another, people simply wouldn't believe them. And they wouldn't buy into that new positioning, positioning statement that they were, they were trying to make. All right, so cool. So we have this idea of this positioning and this idea that we want to align what we do with our market. So how do we pull this together? How does this all, all work? So four steps. Um, again, this is a research process. This is entirely data-driven. Um, so we'll talk about this for a little bit. If we have some time, we can go through a data illustration. Um, which would be nice to be able to do, just to kind of give you, give you an idea. Um, first and foremost, um, so, so we need to start with the features or the attributes or the concepts that the customer thinks is important for your product. Okay, we actually call <coughs> those things determinant attributes. Okay, so when you're doing any type of perceptual mapping or positioning, first thing we need to know is what features are important to the customer. Price is probably going to be one of them. Quality, performance of the product is probably going to be another one. Um, maybe some of those personality trait things. But, but these are the types of things. Like if you ask a customer, what are the two or three most important things about this product that cause you to buy it, what are those things? That's what we need to ask. Step number one. Okay, step number one. So we have to ask the customer what those, what those things are, all those determinant attributes. Um, lots of different ways we can do this, uh, but done through research, um, we, get this, we get this list of features. Okay, so now step number two, Simply enough, we want to go out back into the marketplace and we want customers to, um, to, to rate the performance <laughs> of ourselves and our customers on those features or on those attributes, okay? So we're going to have a data set. Uh, we're going to have measures of price, of, you know, price perceptions. Uh, we'll have measures of all of these attributes that the customer thinks is important for us and for all of our competitors, right? It'd probably be on a scale of something, like a one to five scale, one to seven scale, something along those lines, right? Um, there are a bunch of different processes, again, to collect the data to be able to do that. It's not relatively hard, but that's, that's the thing that we need to be able to do. Okay, so go, step number one, identify these attributes. Step number two, measure the performance of our firm and our competitors' firms on those attributes. Okay, step number three, very importantly, what we need to do is we need to go market segment by market segment, and we need to identify how important these attributes are to each market segment. Okay, I've already used this illustration of the eating out of the diet at a restaurant. 
So some people are very price conscious. So we have, might have a market segment that's very price conscious. We already have a market se segment that's very health conscious. So the healthy eating you know, is an attribute that's very important for the healthy eating market segment, right? We have a, a market segment that might be into socializing and partying and having fun. So the atmosphere of the restaurant might be the attribute that's important to them. Okay, so very, very key to this is we need to know by market segment which of these attributes are most important. So we've got to have a rating scale. We need to measure that. Okay? Okay, cool. So this is step number three. All right? Okay, step number four, we start to put these measures of these results into a graphical display. We chart or we make, make a, a, a graph of some type to show this. Now, there's three different, or there's two different images. Um, the you know, kind of simple, naive way here is to do like a, just a two by two or, two, or a three dimensional space, a two dimensional or three dimensional space where you just kind of graph things. Now, the, the two dimensions would be two of the attributes that we think are important. We just kind of saw that a little earlier in the illustration. A three-dimensional space with these three. Okay, so we'll talk about these here in a little bit, but the last step here is, is the mapping step. Right? <coughs> okay, so you guys have probably seen perceptual maps before, maybe a little bit. Yeah, probably seen some of these. Here are some examples. Okay, again, a very standard, basic, perceptual map is a price quality perceptual map. You'll see these all the time. All right, these are kind of like the basics. Like, I don't really know. This is like, if you don't know what the, your determinant attributes are, you don't really know what the customers really look like. Want, you know, always go to a price quality determinant map, and that'll just be like the standard, okay? And the price quality standard, you know, map, there are these spaces that are optimal, right? Low price needs to associate with low quality. You'd love for, um, you know, maybe some, some mismatches, but you're not going to get it, right? People aren't going to pay you more money for bad quality, right? So that's going to be kind of a space. You've got some space in the middle, and then you've got space in the quadrant that has higher price, higher quality. It's kind of the way it is. If you're on the off diagonal, you're in trouble, probably, right? In some some way, shape, or form. Okay, so think about this as price and quality are two determinant attributes. Where do we score on those two traits? Like, where would you plot us on this space? Would we where would we be as perceived by the customer and Market segments, where would the market segments be in this space as well? And do I, am I close to one of those? All right, so this is kind of like one example. Here's another example. It's an example of um, snacks and, and, you know, snack item type things on a couple of different dimensions, not price quality this time, on crunchiness, either high or low, and nutritional value high and low. So these are two very different determinant attributes. Somebody would have gone to the trouble of doing some research and they identified these two as apparently important features that you might you know, kind of describe snacks as. Crunchy or nutritious, crunchiness dimension and nutritious dimension. And they've gone to the trouble of asking customers, well, how would you rate these products? on these two dimensions, and they've mapped them out, right? So now, here's the thing. If your market segment you're trying to go to is a health nut market segment, like a health conscious market segment, then you know there are certain products over here that you want to push, right? Or that you want to stock in your store, or that you want to serve in your restaurant, as opposed to other ones, right? So this kind of gives us a guidance as to kind of the perception customers have with products and how we can start to align 
what we do towards those interests and towards those wants, right? Okay, so this is kind of kind of the start of this. This is kind of where we're going. Here's yet another example. We're going to look at a couple of views here. Everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people think, think of beers that would fall in this space. And there are, again, two different dimensions. One's price or price-related. Budget versus kind of premium is a price-related concept, right? But then we also have sort of this heavy versus light dimension as well, right? And again, this is kind of this idea like these two dimensions would presumably be important for the customer to, you know, kind of for the customer's perspective, right? So, you know, somebody did some research, they measured perceptions of these different brands. Now you can kind of see there are some gaps and spaces that have openings like just below heavy in that area, kind of in this space here, it looks like there's not a lot of competition, maybe up in this middle space. And you can kind of look around here from a strategic perspective and say, well, you know, where could a new brand be? Where could be some pockets of customers who are underserved? Right? Right? You can kind of think of it that way. All right, now, what we're going to do, though, is we're at the same time, this is the same graph, basically, only this time, what's mapped on here are different types of customers by their profile name. So remember, like, we do a customer, customer segmenting, create a segment, and then we do a profile. And then we describe that profile. So we just have the name. So we have some customers who are on a budget. That, so this group of customers would describe people who, you know, they're in the market, they want to buy, but they're on a budget. And they would prefer beers that are products that are kind of in this space. We've got blue collared, we have people who want good value, we have full bodied, heavy, we have beers that are popular with men, I don't know why, but pale in color, less filling, but the names that are kind of on here are our customers, right? Because remember, that was step number three. We have to be able to capture segment preferences on these attributes. Because what we'll do is we'll overlap the two, and we'll do what's called a joint space perceptual map. And that's what we do here. We do what's called a joint space perceptual map, where we overlay brands with market segments. Okay. Now, this gives us, like, like, where did we get the, well, we did data. We've gathered data. These are all on scales. So we can look at, for instance, if you did this correctly, you could actually measure the distance between Old Milwaukee and Stroh's. We can calculate how far apart they are from each other. We can see that Miller Lite and Coors Light probably close to each other. You know, kind of Coors Light and Michelob are much closer to each other. Bex and Heineken are practically direct competitors because of their proximity to each other, right? So you kind of learn a lot from a map like this if it's done correctly. You just don't randomly put dots up there. You map them based on what the data says. And we can calculate distance from, from competitors. We can identify who our close competitors are. But we can also Look at like our distance to, remember that idea of a market segment centroid? Remember that concept earlier when we did clusters? We had centroid cluster, uh, cluster centroid centers. Think of these as like a cluster center, wherever the dot would be for, for, these, for these market segments, right? So, so now we can be pretty kind of precise in our thinking of how far we are away from customers on these specific dimensions, right, on these two dimensions. Now, if I want to be, you know, if I'm right now, uh, ooh, we don't have Bud Light up here, but if I'm Budweiser, if I'm, and I want to offer a new beer, and I want to be attractive to 
you know, some other some other market segment that I offer the new beer, but it has to have the trait that would bring me closer to that market segment. Um, if I want to be perceived as premium, I want to be perceived as premium. I just need to make a fancier package and raise my price. Isn't that what I do? Maybe put the product in a better location in the store, right? Then I'll be perceived as premium, right? It might not taste any different, but the perception will be a lot less expensive, right? Right, I mean, that's, that's one strategy to get up to that premium thing. So in other words, if I'm, I don't know, if I'm Coors and I want to be perceived as a direct competitor to Bex, raise my price, repackage the product, and move myself up there. Right? Over time, it takes a little bit of time to do this, but this is kind of the strategy. So when we look at this from a managerial perspective, there's this idea of bringing new products in and where do I position myself if it's a new product. Um, we can do two different approaches. Um, we can either choose a space on the map where there's nobody else, where I wouldn't have any direct competition. So again, I might, I, might, I might actually kind of, I've got the little, little blinker there. I might actually choose a, a space in here. There's actually all the space in here that, that might lend itself to a new product with no direct competition. That's one option. Another thing I could do is I could drop myself with a new product in a space where there is competition with the idea that I'm going to steal market share from. What if I saw, what if I saw here, maybe Bud Light was in this area and I saw that they were in trouble. So I thought maybe now would be a good time for me to enter this market and I could steal their market share from them. Right? So that's a strategy that we might consider doing. Right? The third thing, established product, if you want to relocate, if you want to move yourself, maybe Budweiser. Um, doesn't necessarily want to be perceived as so heavy in that in that market space. Maybe they want to move, or maybe they want to move down here, or maybe they want to sort of relocate themselves to a different market segment. Um, they would need to adjust their marketing mix a little bit to give a different perception, either more premium, less premium, probably lighter, something like that. Okay, does that make sense? And so this process is used all the time. This is something that is done on a pretty regular basis, but there's, it's all data-driven in terms of how we create this, this mapping process. And it, um, yeah, and so there you go. The thing that I wanted to kind of, kind of take away or, or let you think about in, in a little bit of a, in a broader sense, and again, we can look at another illustration with some data, um, it's pretty limited to use two dimensions, right? But in reality, consumers don't use just two dimensions to make a decision. We literally look at lots and lots of product elements to make a decision. So again, with some statistical software, um, there's a process called multidimensional scaling. There's also a process called correspondence analysis, um, where we take lots and lots of dimensions. We can create, create an algorithm um, to explain each customer's preference. And um, by doing that, we can, we can create the same type of map, similar, um, but it's a that's all, all of the dimensions together at once. Okay, so, and again, it's, if you ever need more specification in terms of beyond two dimensions, which you, know, you probably will, then MDS or CA is what you're probably going to be using. I just want to throw those out there because those are sort of terms that, that you use. Um, here's another kind of a different visualization of Lots of different, lots of different um, features all laid at once. Um, sometimes we call this a snake diagram. Um, we pair um, two or three or four brands against each other, and we see how they each compete on each of these dimensions. 
Well, imagine a perceptual map that uses all of these dimensions simultaneously and maps, maps them out instead of just using two dimensions. That's what MDS does. Um, so it's a helpful tool for you. Okay, so I just want to leave you with that notion that if you wanted to get deeper into some of the analysis and, and stuff that's done, it's all there. Um, you just have to kind of let me know. Okay? All right. Are you doing okay so far? How are we doing on time? Oh, perfect. Perfect. That's, this is great. This is my favorite topic of the year. It's one of them. Brands. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, last thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help, help show you with, remember this data, we've got all this data here. Uh, there's all this other data here too that deals with the company, it's the companies themselves. I'm gonna pull up, pull up for you um, this file. This file is available for you again on, uh, on Google. It's called the Perceptor Model. And it's just, again, a template, just like we saw before with the clustering template. This template, though, allows you to directly input some of this data, and it just creates some maps for you. Okay, so this is all I wanted to show you today. Um, this first example here, um, oops, this first example right here, so this is the perceptor model. Um, and we can probably do this, make it, hopefully you can see that. Um, yeah, so so remember we have these, in this case, two different attributes. I think it was health and one other one. I can't remember, innovation or something like that. Remember we had these two different attributes, and we had the scores for these different market segments. Now, this first example here, I've just got some numbers in there. You can go ahead and put your numbers in. Um, where those scores would be. You might see some negatives only because that's the... That's the way the axes are, are drawn here. Don't really worry about those. The point is, when you collect your data, you get your scores from each segment in terms of these attributes, how important they are to the, to the, to the segments, right? So you plop those in there. Um, you can also include the market size for each of those segments, right? And we'll show our our restaurant data here in just a second, we'll look at that. The, the other thing that you're going to input, and this happens to have your brand and then three other brands, so it says a total of four brands, but you also put in the scores that each company or each brand has on these two dimensions. So, Because remember, we're collecting perceptions of brand performance on these attributes, and we're collecting how important these attributes are for each market segment. So you plop that data, that information in there, and um, conveniently it'll, it'll actually pop out here for you your market share, market share in each market segment for those brands. But, but also it'll give you this, this nice little map. It'll draw this map out here for you, and you can add these brand names if you want. We have a segment down there, we have a segment up here, we have a segment right there, right? So this just kind of generated the map for us. All we had to do was have the data and, and, and plop, plop it in there. So again, this is a tool, if, it, if it's helpful for you, then, then that would be great. Um, down below here, went ahead and put Jose's and Charlie's, those are our two our two restaurants in the data that we looked at earlier. Um, we had a couple. We had a couple market segments, so I went ahead and plopped those market segments in there. I'm not sure why this average. Those averages aren't the way they're supposed to be, but this data here is correct. Um, also, from that data set, I didn't show it to you earlier, but we have some perceptions of Charlie. And, and Jose's restaurants on the health dimension and also on the atmosphere or social dimension. So this is actually data that, that's there as well. So we'll just pop on over here and kind of look at, see where we are. So we've got, we've got two different, we have two different segments. Again, I'm not sure why that average shouldn't really be there, but we have the, the innovative mavens we have the innovative socials. So I did this earlier before we kind of done the earlier work. 
um, just as an illustration for you. And we see Jose and we see Charlie. So these are two different restaurants. Charlie really isn't positioned towards either one. Jose is positioned towards the innovative socials. So they're going to draw a lot, of, a lot of attention there. Now, the key here is what if we had our brand? And what if we came in here and wanted to position ourselves among these two market segments? Um, kind of what would we do? Where would we go? If, if we viewed ourselves as kind of like a three there, you know, kind of positioning ourselves on the health scale right in the middle, and on the social scale, if we, again, kind of bumped ourselves off maybe 4.5, kind of in between, you know, we could kind of look at this map again, and we could kind of see where we position ourselves on those two dimensions relative to our, our you know, these two, these two market segments that we would have generated from cluster analysis. So it's kind of like this idea of segmenting. We do some segmenting <coughs> in the clusters, and there's a process for it. But then we use the clusters, and we use those cluster profiles, those segment profiles, to help us define where we want to be in the marketplace. Right? So these kind of processes go together. You can't really do segmenting and targeting it without positioning. You can't do positioning without the other two for sure. Um, there's no doubt about that. And so this is all kind of it. So your brand, your brand, what you become as a brand, it will be defined by the attributes that you offer in the marketplace. And again, if you want to be more attractive to the socials, innovative socials here, then you move yourself up. If we go back to this main, main page, we just kind of added these numbers here. If we pull this over, and, and we look at and we look at kind of these averages like our brand well we're going to attract 59 60 percent of segment number two again I'm not quite sure why we have segment number three there I'm not sure what those were but 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 that's kind of the way this works and